My name's Michael Borthwick and I've been working uh, doing museum control systems and media playback systems and video production in cultural institutions according to my bio since 1995. The first installation I did used laser disc players to play the video uh, and I've worked through all the technologies right up to you know the iPhone. There's apps on the App Store that have MPEG-4 that I encoded using Apple's command line tools, which you can download. I'm going to talk about uh, two open source hardware projects which I'm sure just about everybody is familiar with. That's the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, and give you some case studies of how I've been using those two platforms in my work uh, with cultural institutions, which is museums, galleries, archives and libraries collectively known as GLAM, the GLAM sector. So here's an Arduino uh, project that started in Italy in 2008. Come on in. Uh, features a, an 18 mega 8-bit microprocessor, a bunch of analog input ports, digital input ports. A lot of people who've been experimenting with electronics for a long time were sceptical about the Arduino when it came out. They didn't really understand what value it actually offered. People have been blowing software into 8-bit microprocessors for a very long time and all of a sudden there were these new, uh, a new audience of artists and creative people who were coming up on the traditional AVR mailing lists and asking all sorts of questions and people were like, what? You know, what is this weird Arduino thing. I think what they got right, they did, did a couple of things. They put USB on there. So traditionally you would use a programmer to burn your software into the microcontroller and then you'd put that in your target board and if it didn't work you'd take it out again. We're going back away. So they integrated the ability to do um, a direct programming of the target chip without taking it out of the board and it's powered by USB so you don't need to have a bench power supply and they uh, used a couple of existing open source projects, uh, processing a uh, Java-based IDE for programming microcontrollers and a hardware board that was already in existence called Wiring. I simplified that down and published it as an open source project under Creative Commons. You can download the design files, the schematics and the board files for all their products. And it's been incredibly successful and, as I said, opened up a market that no one really knew existed for creative people and students to learn about what uh, some people call physical computing. So computing that interacts with the real world, uh, wearables, um, and as you'll see with my projects, uh, working in museum exhibits. So I'm going to give you four case studies and I've organised it based on the different kinds of inputs and outputs that the systems make use of. Let's have a look at a project from Oxfam and uh, I'll let the Oxfam people uh, introduce this one. Oxfam, All right, turn up the audio. And around the world, um, and started brainstorming ways that we could, uh, I guess, raise awareness and educate people about refugee experiences. Uh, and what culminated from that was the exhibition that you see here today, Refugee Realities. So then I would take the uh, the group, oh, half the group, through a, a jungle passage, and it's quite interesting in there. There's um, it's decorated like a jungle, and it's quite warm as well. So straight away they're in a different environment and then we take them to the minefield and we explain that the journey becomes very dangerous and there are a whole lot of conditions that can make this journey dangerous. They could be attacked by wild animals, they could be shot at, but one of the things that they're going to have to face is travelling through a minefield. The minefield's set up again with uh, soundscape and lighting and there are small devices on the floor which represent mines and if people step on certain areas of the floor, a bomb goes off and they get a badge which flicks up into the air and we ask them if, they, if that happens to them that they put the badge on and that will represent the fact that they've been injured. I've actually realised one of the places that people got quite affected is um, in the desert, in the minefield area. 
And I was, I was taking a tour of this girl, and the girl didn't want to walk on the landmark, so she asked the mom to, to carry her up. It was amazing that, uh, you know, how, how much that was true. You know, think about younger children that had to go through the same experience as her. At least here she had a choice, you know, to, to be carried by a mom, and this was not a real situation. But what about for those young people, you know, that, that had to travel through that, that have actually lost a leg or have lost a limp? It, it touches me to realize that it, it also can, can touch other people, and other people can go, oh my God, this is what other people are going through. And you can see that reaction. Be you know, uh, feeling sad or actually, you know, the, the emotion just hitting home that this is what other people are living through. And that fact that someone shows some sort of emotion, I mean, it just gives you so much belief in, in the fact that we are all human and we all have, you know, common values. It's kind of sad when you think of how, like, some people could die here and, like, even on the way here, like, when we went through the desert part and there were all the landmines going off and in the jungle there were all the dangerous animals and stuff and it's so sad to think some people don't even make it to the camp. So everyone gets a blindfold and they stand in a line and we travel through a corridor blindfolded and everyone has their hands on the shoulder of the person in front of them. And we explain you have to travel slowly and carefully to make sure that the group stays safe again. That's quite freaky for everyone because they have no idea where they're going and we, walk, we actually end up walking outside as well. So it's, it's really disorientating for them. They have no idea where they'll end up. To be immersed in a, a somatic experience, uh, to, I guess, lose your, your senses on this journey and in a literal way, uh, wearing the blindfold, uh, having that uh, sense of stumbling through the dark, being out here in the humidity with, with no shelter, very powerful way of sending a message that this is a, a lived experience and this is an experience which is more than half an hour or an hour. This is an experience that will go on for years and years and years. So Refugee Realities, that project was done by Oxfam Australia in 2008 down at the uh, Gasworks Park in South Melbourne, targeted at school age kids. They had 7,000 students through there in the week that it operated. Uh, it was uh, written up in the New York Times, um, BBC World Service, had quite an impact. And I think uh, obviously today, um, you know, concerns about refugees are even more salient than they were at the time. I'd uh, offered my services to Oxfam in the lead up to that project a couple of months before. I hadn't heard anything from them and then I got a phone call from uh, a very talented young sound designer who'd taken on the job of creating those uh, atmospheric minefield effects at midnight on Sunday night and the project opened to the public at 9am on Friday morning. So uh, we had a meeting about how we were going to uh, do this. Uh, how we were going to create an experience where people move through these through the desert room uh, around various speakers and trigger the sounds. What we came up with was, was an idea of having foot switches buried under the sand. They would connect through some sort of interface to be defined to her Akai uh, sampler, vintage sampler, through some power amps and to a bunch of speakers which would be distributed through the desert room as you saw people picking their way through. But the reality was at that time, uh, I said, you know, do you have these foot switches? Do you know how we're going to make them? And she said, no. And I said, this interface, does that actually exist? No. <laughs> what about the power amps? We need five or six channels of power amplification. Do we have that? No. <laughs> what about the speakers? We've got some speakers. No. Um, and no budget to buy anything, and 96 hours to pull it off. So how are you going to do that? <laughs> so what I decided to do was to uh, build up from scratch an, an interface that would take uh, contact closures from people standing on uh, sensors that we embedded under the sand and connect that to an Arduino. So here I'm making up um, in my kitchen a front panel for this box which has some uh, nice uh, connectors on the front that connect to the foot switches. And MIDI goes out on the five pin DIN connector on the back. So 
So populating that front panel board. Uh, using the PCB itself as a front panel is, a, is an old trick that I probably picked up from Talking Electronics magazine um, decades ago. A very effective way of quickly building up uh, one-off projects. Here's a little video of, of how it works. So you can see we've got some galvanised plates that are insulated from each other. There's just a standard product from the hardware shop going into one of the channels on the interface board. And when you press it down, you can see the MIDI on-off notes going to, in this case, the terminal. Uh, but uh, ultimately, in the project, goes to the Akai uh, sampler and triggers those sounds. And that's a it's a multi-channel sampler, so we could direct the audio out to the appropriate power amplifier channels. And I've also I put some little diagnostic switches on the front and some very bright LEDs because I've done enough projects where you're going, is that on? Is that working? I want to be able to see it from the other side of the room, you know, through the camouflage netting. So I've shown how I built up the hardware. What made this possible was a community of people who both publish useful libraries, um, and there's a MIDI library for the Arduino, uh, and I really just used the canonical reference implementation of that library. Uh, I built three of these boxes because I anticipated I'd have one on site, I'd have one that I would send out to a third party programmer who I thought I might be able to convince to help me out for free on the project, and then I thought I'd have one at home so I could test his code before going down and swapping those two boxes over on site. But it turned out that I found a sketch uh, from a guy called Todd, uh, who I, th I think it was a Halloween project. In fact, a lot of really useful stuff is done in service of Halloween and <laughs> Christmas celebrations in, in the US. And I pretty much just uh, did a very simple rewrite of his sketch and loaded that into the box, and it just worked. So I didn't actually need, uh, you know, even though I couldn't really program my way out of a wet paper bag, I was able to use his code and pull that project off, and it was very successful. The next one was a project for the Art Centre uh, featuring the artist Nick Cave, and not so much about his music, but about his creative process and his process of ideation and how he comes up with his ideas. Some sh photos from the, uh, the bump in, signing some, some walls. The thing to notice about this exhibition is the walls are very thin. They're made of uh, MDF skinned foam and that makes it light and easy to dismantle it to it all around Australia and some overseas sites. And DVD players were concealed vertically in the walls and so they were inaccessible. So what I did was come up with this little controller board. When the exhibition is powered up, it simply sends infrared commands to the DVD players and fires those up. And there's an infrared library for the Arduino which is under very active development. I'm on the mailing list and there's posts there every day adding new protocols, supporting new kinds of devices and appliances. Infrared's not ideal, it's, only, it's a one-way communication medium, you can't ask the DVD player what it's doing. Uh, but in the museum space, in the cultural space, you don't always have money to buy industrial quality gear. Sometimes you just have to go down and grab a $15 DVD player and do your best with that. Third project is for the Royal Australian Air Force Museum, which is just up the road at Point Cook free museum, open seven days a week, well actually not open Monday, six days a week, uh, and some great displays of classic RAAF aircraft. What they wanted to do was activate a Pratt & Whitney R1830 radial aircraft engine. They were made between 1932 and 1951 and powered about seven different kinds of RAAF aircraft over the years, including several of their flying boats. The classic way of operating an electromechanical interactive in a museum is one of these switches. You push it in and it slowly comes out, a vacuum switch. They wanted something a little bit more up to date than that and something that was more hygienic to clean. <laughs> <laughs> this is from an apartment near me in Richmond. So this is the museum and a bit of video of the engine in operation.
<laughs> so that runs, runs for 30 seconds and then the, the uh, visitor can't operate it again for another 30 seconds. So the idea is that they will lose interest and, and move on to something else. And that's because obviously it's been sectioned, it's been cut away, the engine has no oil pressure. So to prevent uh, you know, too much wear and tear, we've got a 50% duty cycle to try and control how much it can be used. Because we, as we all know, kids like to get there and they hammer away on it. So I came up with uh, this uh, controller board. It's a double-sided controller board that again can be programmed with the Arduino environment. One of the things that they uh, asked me to do as a value add was to see if we could log the date and time of the engine activation. So what I did was uh, add uh, a battery and a real-time clock chip on the back, a DS3232 uh, Dallas Semiconductor real-time clock. I added an SD card holder and some logic to translate from the SD card's native 3.3 volt voltage level to the five volts that I'm running my microprocessor at. You could do that with individual commercial components. You could buy an official Arduino. Uh, you could go to John Oxer at Freetronics and get yourself a 16 by 2 LCD display. You could go to SparkFun Electronics in Colorado and get a breakout board for DS3232. You could go to um, Artifruit in New York and get an SD card socket with the voltage level translation. So what's that, HC4050. Uh, hook all that up, then you've got four pins to drive, or three pins to drive an RGB LED to give the user the feedback. It's green when the exhibit's idle, it's blue when the engine's running, and it's red when you need to wait 30 seconds before you can have another go. And then you've also got an input from the capacitive touch sensor, which I've built into the uh, graphic panel. And then you've run out of pins, so then you've got to add in a 8-bit shift register to drive the LCD. So you can do that with individual bits, but I wanted to present a more coherent solution. So I integrated all of that into my own circuit board and fitted some robust Molex KK connectors to come up with the right answer. The thing I wanted to emphasize in this case study, oh, this is just a paper prototype I made to make sure everything was going to fit and built that up. The thing that I want to emphasize here is, is the importance of the libraries that the Arduino community makes available. I couldn't write um, the, you know, a driver for the liquid crystal display um, or the real-time clock or a fat file system that works on an SD card. But I can stand on the shoulders of these giants, these people who really know how to write code, and use these libraries and then on top of that write a relatively thin piece of application software that sits on there and utilises all that effort that they've made. Um, you know, it's like having a workforce of thousands of people who've invested tens of thousands of hours of effort into uh, solving these problems lower down the technology stack than I'm comfortable or want to operate. The final project I'll talk about was for the Art Centre Victoria and that was an exhibition about the band ACDC called Australia's Family Jewels. <laughs> and the brief here, they have, uh, they partnered with Sony uh, to put on the exhibition and they had access to high resolution footage of the band's performances around the world. And this key element of the exhibition was called the main stage. So you've got high definition video projection and that's flanked by some rock and roll uh, park hands as they're called and what they wanted to do was synchronise the lighting show with the video playing off the Blu-ray. Okay. Synchronise the, uh, the lighting show with the Blu-ray. They are, I suppose we can all think of lots of ways you could do that. You could have a text file with a whole lot of lighting cues or something in it but how are you going to synchronise that with a video? In particular how are you going to express the creative relationship between what you want the the audio and the video and the lighting to do. So if you imagine you're in a domestic a home cinema environment, sitting in your comfy chair, you've got the screen at the front, you've got a left speaker and a right speaker and a centre speaker and a left surround and a right surround speaker. In this exhibition we only need left and right 
and the low frequency subwoofer channel. So what I decided to do was appropriate the unused surround sound channels on the blue ray and encode the lighting information on the surround sound tracks. Not in a profoundly elegant way, simply by mapping volume levels on the surround sound tracks to how bright I wanted the lights to be. So this is the uh, schematic for the whole system. The interesting bit is the synchronised lighting controller in the middle, which is an Arduino uh, front-ended by a precision full-wave bridge rectifier, which takes the plus or minus one volt audio from the surround sound tracks on the Blu-ray player and rectifies that, amplifies it to five volts and feeds that into the analog inputs on the AVR. Does anybody know the precision of the analog inputs on an AVR? How many bits of precision you've got? So it's, it's actually 10 bit. So that gives you anybody how many different values? So you've got 1,024 different values. DMX is a serial protocol for controlling lighting systems, which some of you might have heard of. And it's an 8-bit protocol here. I'm building it up. So you've got a par can, the lighting dimmer, and one of my little target boards down here, and the DMX connector, which is uh, an XLR connector. So you can use standard uh, audio cables to route the DMX signal around the place. A little, little bit of a close-up. So we've got a 10-bit audio in value, and we've got to create an 8-bit uh, level for DMX, so the actual application code, the logic of this is absurdly simple. I'm simply multiplying by 2.5 and blowing that out the DMX channel as fast as I possibly can. But that is enough. You know, that worked and this exhibition toured all around Australia. It toured to Seattle, it toured to, um, to the Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow. And I'm supposed to have some video of that playing, so let's just see what's going on there. Okay, don't have it. All right, we'll come back to that if we get a chance. So that's four case studies of using the Arduino in interesting ways in museums. I want to move on and talk about the Raspberry Pi. There it is. How's it different to an Arduino? You've got an ARM processor, uh, 512 megabytes of RAM, USB, Ethernet, GPIOs, camera inputs, and digital video outputs. This is the, uh, the new version, so this has got, adds four USB ports, more RAM, uh, quad-core processor. What's really interesting to me about the Raspberry Pi as a person who works in museums is the high-definition uh, video output. And I recognised as soon as they came out that this was potentially fantastic and inexpensive tool to replace uh, the proprietary hardware which museums traditionally use, they use digital signage hardware. Personally, I don't think that um, playing video in museums is necessarily always a digital signage problem. Digital signage problems are you know, found in food courts and so forth, but often the video content you're trying to play back in cultural institutions is by definition quite old. It could be four by three aspect ratio, interlaced, 25 hertz material. And if you throw that on a typical digital signage player, it'll distort it and play around with the frame rate, it isn't what you want. You need to respect the video essence and give people as close as possible an experience like they had when the video was originally shot. This is the uh, RWF Museum again. I did an installation there in 2001 where I put in hard drive based video players and those players played MPEG-1 video. So 352 by 288 pixels was the resolution and those things cost three and a half thousand dollars each. Um, put them in in 2001, most of them are still running, so although that's incredibly expensive, they're bulletproof um, using SCSI hard drives, but a Raspberry Pi has um, 1920 by 1080 resolution. So you've got two orders of magnitude, at least more pixels, and you know, the price difference is two orders of magnitude less. <laughs> So in a little more than the decade, we've you know, got four orders of magnitude better value for money and I tried to sort of map that onto Moore's Law and just got tied up in knots, but <laughs> yeah, it's quite impressive. This is the, 
the rear of that installation at the RWF Museum, so some you know, behind the scenes at the museum uh, footage. That's the raspberry pi in that little black case. So that just sits there. That's, that installation's been running for two years. And I set the Pi up with a read-only file system. So uh, these devices are typically, in smaller museums, not managed in any way. There's no control system overlay from AMX or somebody like that that shuts everything down gracefully. And people don't go around and, you know, pseudo shut down DASH now <laughs> you know, on every device. They just turn the power off. So this thing boots up every day and it complains because it's got a read-only file system and it just does what it's supposed to do and the next day it's forgotten its issues. <laughs> this is an exhibition uh, that the State Library did last year called Victor Hugo Les Miserables from Page to Stage. And it was the first time that Victor Hugo's original manuscript for Les Miserables had ever left Europe. Flew out from Europe in its own case, its own seat on Etihad. And I did three uh, motion graphics pieces for this museum and the Raspberry Pis here ran for 14 weeks uh, non-stop without any issues whatsoever. Here's the installation. I, I show this ju just to show how, how diminutive a Raspberry Pi is in conjunction with, in contrast to the displays that it's driving. And this is, uh, this is a, a graphic that I made up that was retweeted by the Raspberry Pi Foundation was called, it's a Raspberry Re Revolution, and it was talking <laughs> about um, how we'd use pies uh, in this exhibition. And it was the first ticketed exhibition, so the first paid up exhibition that an Australian library have ever mounted. So it, it um, shows that you can use open source technologies in commercial applications and it's not uh, you know, flaky. This is an exhibition that I worked with an artist on recently at the Centre for Contemporary Photography in Fitzroy and here we've actually, if you can see it, attached a Raspberry Pi uh, 2 onto a piece of plywood and then we've just sandwiched that between the wall and the uh, screen mount. So that's one of the ways that they're kind of handy because they're so skinny that you can actually mount them between the screen and the wall. So that's just uh, basic video, looping video playback. The thing that's exciting me at the moment is using Raspberry Pis to make cultural burials more accessible and that means utilising their ability to support subtitles or closed captions for deaf and hearing impaired people. So. So what I'm showing there is, is a single channel capacitive touch sensor that connects to the GPIOs on the Raspberry Pi and that's simply toggling subtitles on and off. So a, a deaf or hearing impaired person could turn English captions on on an exhibit and they would run for the duration of the loop and then they'd turn themselves off. In uh, New Zealand a few months ago I presented a system, uh, sort of I guess the most advanced state that I've got this in at the moment and that's not just providing closed captions in English, but in a variety of other languages. So this is where uh, I'm going to try and give you a live demo of multi-channel playback. Hmm, interesting. All right, so I bought along a HDMI switcher, but that doesn't play well with the uh, conference recording system, so we're going to try and manually change all that over. So we'll do the, we'll mute the audio and plug this into my Pi down here. So far, so good, thank you. <laughs> Can you mop my brow? <laughs> uh, 
The video is a bit jittery. We don't know why that is. But we do have video. So this is a, a piece of looping video footage that I got from the Māori Language Commission, uh, who kindly donated this to me, not donated, but made it available to me. And they provided me with the Māori transcript of what's being said and an English translation. So some of you might be able to see this Jackson, box me down here. Ratira, this asa. has two capacitive touch sensors and some RGB LEDs. So if you want to um, have the Te Reo Māori closed captions, then you can turn on that channel. I'm actually doing that from, Sullivan, from the back. Yeah. Or um, change over to English. And the thing to note is that's just changing over on the fly, so it's switching from one subtitle language to the other. In the, in the unusual situation where I've actually seen uh, museums close caption their content, they usually have multiple videos and they open caption it so the captions are burnt in. So if you come up to the video about the dinosaur and you want the English closed caption version, then you press that button and it will start again from scratch. So what I'm demonstrating here is the ability to be able to switch between uh, as many languages as you can be bothered translating your content into um, on the fly. We did get the live demo, so that's good. So I'm just going to change back to my laptop. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I don't need audio. And I'll just give you a bit of an overview of the software architecture that makes that possible. So we've got a Raspberry Pi. We've got this box that I've designed that's got a two capacitive touch sensors, some RGB LEDs behind the capacitive touch sensors to communicate to the museum visitor what's going on. They send signals to the GPIOs and the Pi is also sending uh, signals back to the box to illuminate the LEDs appropriately. Uh, it's all controlled by a state machine written in Python, so I'm working through an edX Python course at the same time as I'm trying to make this stuff work to teach myself some Python. So that uses uh, a module, the uh, RPI GPIO module, to communicate with the GPIOs, to control the LEDs and listen to what's uh, happening with the touch sensors. That Python program calls uh, bash script called dbuscontrol.sh, which is part of the OMX player library, part of the OMX player application, I guess, for the Raspberry Pi. So that's using an interprocess communication protocol used on Linux called dbus. And that, in turn, is toggling the subtitles on and off on the Raspberry Pi or changing the subtitle language. Thanks, Lynn. I was going to have a slide showing what's underneath that, which is uh, FFmpeg and uh, you know video core and the GPU, and I realised I just run out of talent at that point, and I don't <laughs> I really understand what's going on below there. But uh, the guys who are working on the Dreambox who are here this week uh, from Germany will certainly be able to help you out with any questions you've got there. And uh, are there uh, is there any questions from from the audience about what I've been working on? Sure. What sort of uh, the question is, what sort of failure rate have I seen in the hardware? When I got my first two Raspberry Pis and I waited eight months yeah. from the time I paid for them to the time I got them delivered, <laughs> I didn't have any um, micro USB uh, connectors because I thought that's just hipster technology. I don't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Uh, so I powered my Pi directly through the GPIO connector and I put 5 volts into the 3.3 volt <laughs> input and there's no protection so I blew up my first one <laughs> and I reached for my second one to confirm what had gone wrong. <laughs> so then I placed an order with element 14. Um, 
but apart from that, I've had no failures in the field and I've done a lot of testing. Uh, my contribution to IMX Player has been to um, submit a pull request for uh, that debus control of turning subtitles on and off, which was, which was accepted, and also just to sit there and hammer away and do enormous amounts of testing. So I create lots of different test files with different applications. Uh, I had a, an issue for a long time where it would uh, loop for a long time, and I mean weeks, and then crash. And there was a, me and a few other people from around the world trying to get to the bottom of that, and we would um, you know, complain about it, and the maintainers would go, well, it works for us. And I'd say, well, how many times have you tested it? And he said, well, I've tested it with a five-second file 10,000 times. And I said, well, I've tested it with a 20-minute file for a month, and it still doesn't work. And he says, well, I don't believe you. Send me the file. I um, send him the file, and he go, ah, OK, I can see the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you do. I can't fix the problems, but I can uh, communicate them to people who can fix the problems in a structured way. But in terms of hardware, um, I've had no, no failures in the field. I think they're really reliable, but it's an important point because people think, uh, how can a now $5 with the Raspberry Pi Zero computer be a legitimate solution? But, but it is. And the silicon used on the Raspberry Pi is used in set-top boxes and digital signage players, the Broadcom GPU. What's interesting about a Pi is the GPU is very powerful. People have equated the CPU. The Raspberry Pi Foundation themselves have equated the CPU's power to a 300 meg Pentium 2, which isn't very fast, but the GPU is very powerful. In fact, the GPU really boots the CPU um, when you look into it. And when I'm playing high definition 1080p video at 30 megabits per second, which is a very high data rate, the CPU is ticking over at about 7 or 8% because all the work's being done on the GPU. So thanks for that question. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. Ah, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the the question is whether I prefer Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Um, you know, I sort of operate on the principle of, of parsimony, of, of keeping things as simple as possible. And so if you can do it with an Arduino, I would do it with an Arduino, simply because you have complete control over all the software that's running on the processor. When you get involved in the Pi, then you've obviously got layers and layers of software that are being contributed to by thousands of people. And so there's more space for things to go wrong, but there's also more power. But for a simple running a simple state machine for controlling you know, a 60-year-old aircraft engine um, with a single input and uh, running a basic state machine, I wouldn't use a Pi for that. I would just use the simplest thing that I possibly could to, to just have less moving parts. Yes? What's your process to convert really ancient videos that museums often have into something that you can put on the Pi? Uh, so the question is, how do you go about converting uh, legacy a video formats into um, MPEG-4 for the Raspberry Pi. I, I use a, a bunch of um, proprietary compression tools to do that task, um, which you probably haven't heard of, but uh, things like Sorensen Squeeze or Telestream Episode are the, for people who are doing this work commercially. Uh, a lot of people just use FFmpeg, so they do that from the command line. But you do have to be very sensitive uh, or, or aware, you know, I've, I see video all the time at museums that I can't watch. You know, it's just so bad. And that's because there's things wrong, particularly with the interlacing or the frame rate, so things are jumping. So whoever's done that work has just not really had an appreciation for the source material and the output material. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, I did an exhibition called Bohemian Melbourne for the State Library recently, which some of you might have seen, and all the material for that was ripped from DVD. And so I bought the MPEG-2 codex um, for the Raspberry Pi so I could test that. In the end, we went with commercial digital signage players. But I ripped the MPEG-2 and um, played it back as native MPEG-2 because every time you transcode from one format to another, you're doing a whole lot of mathematics on those pixels. And, and um, at best, it makes a slight difference. At worst, it becomes really bad. But and I, I'm happy to give you some advice if you've got some projects like that in mind. Yeah. Was there another question? Um, over here? Um, the, the Arduino's got a few little IDEs that you can put on. Yeah. 
Uh, the question was, is there anything equivalent for developing Python, I guess, on the Pi um, compared to the Arduino's IDE? I guess that would be idle, would it? I've only just used, you know, uh, Nano, just used a text editor. But the, the online course that I'm doing with uh, MIT, they use a commercial product called Canopy, I think, as their Python environment. Yeah. Okay, one more. Uh, yeah, look, that's um, something that I'm working on. <laughs> I mean, I have a, I have a, you know, a, a, a long-term relationship with clients like the RWF Museum, and if I say this is the way that I think it should be done, then they trust me to implement the solution in that way. But certainly, um, knocking on the door and trying to uh, change entrenched practices or commitments to closed solutions is a, is a difficult task and if anybody has been working that problem domain, you know, I'd love to know. Thanks. Okay, I think we're done. No, I, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Lynn. <laughs> so that's a bit, a bit ambiguous when you're holding up your hand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's, look, that's a good point. Um, you will have seen on the, the, so the, so Lynn's question was about um, not so much accessibility for deaf and hearing impaired people, uh, but people with, I guess, uh, who might lack fine motor skills and might find it difficult to operate conventional exhibits. Uh, certainly with the touch sensors, I try and have a really big uh, contact area these are about uh, 30 or 40 mils, so it, children or um, people who ha don't necessarily have great motor skills can operate those, those things successfully. It's a, it's, you know, it's a really good point. And uh, accessibility just isn't about, isn't about ramps, you know, it's about um, what's called universal design, so trying to make experiences that anybody can access, you know, regardless of um, whatever issues that they might have. Yep. Mm. Um, what's your contingency plan for, you know, like acquiring the new Yeezy in ten years' time for like um, <laughs> to like replace failed SD cards and stuff? Like, how do you manage, manage that? I haven't, I haven't considered that. I must say, uh, one of the things that gives me confidence is the Raspberry Pi Foundation have sold six million pies um, from what they hoped. That they thought they were going to sell ten thousand. They've sold six million. Uh, so I think that you will, going forward, always be able to get your hands on them. So that's useful. I have, um, I just make uh, a, an archive of the image of the SD card once I've frozen that, so I can always push out um, new cards, and I give the client a, a spare card. So, it, you know, the first uh, remedial action they can take is to pop in a new card. But you know, that's that's you know, it's a good point. All right, can I take one more question? Um, just in that first example you gave, the, you said, uh, they said the, they wanted the sound and everything, they had the little banks that flipped up or something? Yeah. How did, that, how did you control that? So that, yeah, that's interesting. The, the, the inspiration for the gal plates was the, the system that flicked the badge up. So they just used an electromagnet that flew, flicked up the little badge and then you put the badge on. I didn't have anything to do with that. And the guy who built that system wanted to just have a complete firewall between what he was doing and what I was doing. So I duplicated his mechanism for the gel plates and then I gaffed the whole thing together but made sure that electrically we were insulated from each other. <laughs> so, you know, there was no communication between us. We could have coordinated it, but that didn't happen. But it was controlled from the door? No, they were completely independent systems. Oh, okay. Like literally two of these, just with a piece of... Right. With gaffer over the top. <laughs> and, then, um, no. and then two tonnes of sand. <laughs> No, it wasn't a, me wasn't a mechanical contrivance. It was electromagnetic. So that uh, used an electromagnetic catch, I think, to release the spring. So a uh, volunteer had to go around and reset it after somebody so had... Yeah.
And, it do, and just to put that in context, it's not a scary experience like it might have looked in that four and a half minute exit. Um, Oxfam went to an enormous amount of trouble and worked with psychologists and specialists in this area to make sure that children were, were never frightened. But if you only see that brief exit, it looks like it was a more frightening experience than it was, but they contextualised it um, you know, really well. Thank you very much.